Well, thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm five or ten years ago when I used to do this, I was used to speaking to eight or ten or fifteen people at the most. So in the last year or so, uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the people that are interested in the pollinators, interested in our environment, in the health of our environment. And so uh, this, this helps a lot. I enjoy these little showers. Uh, just one thing, a little bit of history on me. My family's been working bees commercially in this area for 98 years. And uh, my wife and I, Roxanne, and daughters have uh, been running, we've owned it for 32 years. Uh, my daughter sitting back there is currently working for us right now. She's the fifth generation in this business. And uh, my great-grandfather started it, moved here with the CB and Q Railroad in 1918. We are in a building in Ranchester that was built by one of the main carpenters on the Thai Flume on the mountain. He built it in about 1898, and I found his name on one of the windows I replaced years ago. So we've been out in Ranchester a long time. We have 56 locations around Sheridan County. We run 1,500 colonies of bees. Back in the 50s, we were the largest commercial operation in the state of Wyoming. Uh, my grandfather in 55 moved half of our operation out in north central Nebraska to get away from the spraying, which was starting to be pretty prevalent back then. And uh, so now we're we're just a moderate size beekeeping operation. We're not the biggest, we're not the smallest, and we, we run enough bees that run me into the dirt. <laughs> and we used to have some throw over by Powell. Uh, we sold those back in the 90s just to tighten up our operation here, and we've, we've actually made just as much honey or more because we can take better care of our bees here and not be driving so far. Uh, somebody made a comment, one of our first speakers talked about dandelions. Uh, it's been my goal as a commercial beekeeper to try to get those uh, listed as a state flower. <laughs> because dandelions, and I know uh, I pay true green to come into our yard and kill them every spring for us. But uh, they save the commercial beekeeper a lot of money in the spring. We, we feed corn syrup, we doctored up with amino acids, raw organic apple cider vinegar, to put something good in the corn syrup, we feed it until the dandelion flow starts. Yep. And believe me, it's critical, uh, the dandelion. So I tell little school kids, you shouldn't be picking those flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing we, that was mentioned here a little bit ago was weevil and ladybugs. I gotta tell you a funny story about that. Uh, back in the 90s, two ranches out in Dayton, Ranchester area, one guy brought in, I don't know, he mail ordered in thousands and thousands of ladybugs. And I don't know how, I, I don't know how you applicate ladybugs into an alfalfa field for weevil control. But his neighbor sprayed Furidan on the alfalfa field and they've never been friends since. It just <laughs> annihilated the ladybug population. So, pardon? Yeah, a lot of a lot of things. Furidan was uh, a non-discriminate toxic killer, and I'm glad to see that that has uh, been delisted and gone now. We're dealing with other chemicals now, but uh, one of them is Mustang Max, and in our operation, we see that they that is one of the most bee-friendly chemicals that we've seen to come around for honeybees. Now it's suspect in a few other things I understand, but. Uh, for honeybees, we don't move our, our bees anymore because of Mustang Max. And just some, just some topics about, uh, some st statistics about commercial honey production. Just one thing I want you to know is, uh, and I know it's all over if you look on the right websites, there's, it's estimated there's 12 to 15 billion dollars worth of crops that are specifically pollinated. Uh, in the United States and in the in the US uh, and, and I'm not talking about honey production I'm talking about just food on our tables they estimate that one in three bites you eat in your in your food 
is comes directly from a pollinator. And I and uh, and most of the heavy lifting and the pollinating in the United States comes from the honeybee because there's just billions of honeybees around. They're commercially kept by people such as myself. And the honeybees are responsible, in the most part, for <coughs> the food that we eat in this country. And, the, and not just the food, the variety of it, but the quantity that we have. Uh, I don't have the visual aids like some of these people have. I'm, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't intend on taking this up as a career, but I seen a picture one time in this documentary that it showed, uh, you know, like an Albertsons or a Safeway uh, produce aisle, and then we had mounds of apples and mounds of different fruits and vegetables, and then they took the honeybee out of the scene, the pollinators, and you had little, just little clusters of the variety, and some of them were non-existent. Some of them were just gone. But the rest of them, there was just a just a fraction of what we are used to going to see in our grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that the, the, the pollinators, the commercial beekeepers produce, the, the jobs alone from the honey side of it are tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, I think there's about 12 to 1400 commercial beekeeping operations in the United States. And there's about 2.5 million hives of bees in the United States. Uh, in California, in February, when the, when the almond tree starts to, to bloom, they say there's about 1.6 million hives in that state alone. Because there's so many acres, it requires three colonies per acre to pollinate those almond trees. And it, the, the commercial beekeeping just spawns so much uh, a dollar and tax dollars to the United States and jobs to the American public. It's astounding to me, and that's just off that's just off the honey and the food and and, uh, and the other benefits that the pollinators have. It's uh, we really can't put a dollar value on what the honeybee and the pollinators do for the world. And uh, in, the, in the state of Wyoming alone, I think there's about 15 of us who are commercial operators. Uh, and the guy mentioned the sweet clover. I said amen to the sweet clover. Uh, it's, it usually grows in areas where it can't be cut. Unfortunately, most of it can't be watered except like this. And so it does have a pretty short lifespan in this part of Wyoming. But the commercial, the commercial beekeepers right now, and I guess that Clover's clear down south of KC. It's just Gillette. And so the commercial beekeepers are uh, going to have a pretty good year. And the honey from the sweet clover is uh, very light colored and it's uh, really desirable, uh, that, that lighter colored honey. And uh, I wanted to say that because of Molly, I've, I've known her for several years now. The other day, my daughter and I were driving around Wolf Creek. And I drive a pretty big rig. It's a big two-ton international with a load of B boxes on it and a forklift on the back. And we're driving down the county road about 40 miles an hour. And I see two butterflies out, out straight ahead of me. And they're flying about this far apart. And I'm trying to figure out how to slow this thing down and miss them two butterflies. And I, and I appreciate that. <laughs> and I appreciate that for being more aware of that. I mean, um, I love these pictures around here. And one thing I've noticed this spring as a commercial operator, being out in the field every day, we've seen more of the bumblebees this spring than we've seen in years. And I think, I think that's due to we're using less toxic chemicals now. Uh, and we're just seeing more and more of them. So uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, in, in our operation, though, I am seeing an alarming thing, and I've seen it for about three or four years now, and it's something called entombed pollen. And when you, I, it's kind of hard to explain, because when you're looking at a comb, 
that's got the brood and then it's encircled with the pollen and the honey for a food source right right by the brood this pollen is inter intermingled in with the, the brood and the, the other larva, uh, the pollen and honey, but it's capped over. It, it's, it, and that's why they call it entombed. And there's something wrong with it when the bees entomb it. Uh, I've seen various things entombed in a beehive. Uh, some people will shoot them with shotguns. The, the bees will actually cover that little lead BB with with a, a propolis beeswax material. And, and so they're covering that pollen for a reason. And one of these days, before I get too old, I'm gonna dig some out and send it off and get it sampled. I've never done that, just because I've only noticed it in the last three or four years. But there's not a lot of it, but we're seeing more of it. And, and uh, I just can't explain what's going on because I, I, I really believe we're living in a healthier environment now than we were 10 years ago because of the, the lack of malathion and the furidan. Uh, so if there's, if you guys have any questions for me, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a pollinator expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a honey producer. I do have some knowledge about pollination uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have as far as what goes around here in Sheridan County and the bee industry in general. Yes, sir. Are you experiencing pollen class disorder? Well, out of the 1,500 hives, and I can only I can only preface it this way: out of 1,500 hives, we lost over 1,100 hives last winter. We lost over 70% of our outfit. We were down to under 400 hives this April. Now, well, you know, they can, they call it colony collapse. I'm going to pass some things around here, and I should have started when I first got up here. And I, there again, I apologize for my lack of electronic knowledge. Uh, this particular year, I believe that it was more to the, paras the parasites that was brought up earlier. And the Varroa mite is a parasite that uh, is prevalent in bees. And I really believe if they're in the bees, because there's so many bees in a, a heavy honey bee population, that they're getting spread to these other uh, pollinator groups. They can be going into the ground with the, with the hornets, with the wasps, the bumblebees, because if the bees are flying out with these mites on them, that's how they figure they, they get transferred one, from one yard to another, is they'll go out and actually get off on a plant, and then another, another host will come by, and they'll get on it and take off with them. I just want to, I'll pass these out. This particular thing here, if you look at them real close, if you can see better than me, there's a bunch of them on here in underneath this tape that I got out from one of my beehives. And I taped them up so you could see them, but that's what they look like on these pictures. But if you'll just pass them around, I apologize, I should have got those started earlier. So, was a colony collapse? I really don't know, but I, uh, the average loss this year in the commercial beekeepers was over 40%. And I know guys that were up in the 80, 90% range loss. And I know people, I don't, well, I don't have to buy honey, but if I did, I wouldn't like to buy honey because it's so expensive. But honestly, if it wasn't for the, the price of honey, commercial beekeepers would be in very, very deep trouble. Uh, one of the articles I was reading earlier this year was, uh, I have a guy in Dayton that just, when we're gone out in California working bees, feeding bees, he leaves stuff on my doorstep from the Wall Street Journal, and there's been some really good articles in there from the about bees and uh, one of the articles was talking about a 2,000 colony operation and that's not a big operation that's just a little bit bigger than me and it cost almost a quarter of a million dollars to operate that 2,000 colony operation a quarter of a million dollars that's like taking his whole honey crop 
and paying bills with it. And he's left with nothing. And so that's why the pollination thing out in California to, to the commercial operators is so critical. It's critical to, to making money. And then if you lose 70% of your operation or more, if you lose 70% of your income from out there, you're, you're in, in real trouble. Uh, it sounds kind of silly, but we actually spend over $66,000 on bees this spring. Bees. And then that's just part of our expense, the, the food it takes to, to get them started. Uh, the price of honey is critical right now for a commercial operator to survive. And here's another thing you can pass around real quick. When mites get so heavily infested in a, in a hive, they create a virus in the hive, and the bees are actually born with no wings. They can't fly. I first seen this last fall down at Leo Ankeys, down on Lower Tongue River. I was getting out of my truck and, and doing what I do, getting my forklift ramps down and untying the ropes, and, and I could see the the ground was just moving with bees. And, well, I didn't know what it was moving, so I got down on my hands and knees, and there were bees crawling all over the place. And this was 25 feet from the bee yard, from the actual colonies themselves. And they were actually just crawling around in the grass. They couldn't fly. They had two little bones sticking out of their back because of that virus. It's called deformed wing virus. Some people call it stick wing virus. And once that gets into your hive, they're dead. They're, they've got to run the course of just dwindling down to, to a little handful of bees and then just freezing to death, basically. There's nothing you can do once they get that virus in them. Uh, and unfortunately, part of that was my fault. I just underestimated the mite load this spring when they came back from California. And Part of that problem is the, the drought in California. It's unusually warm out there in January and February. It has been for several years now. When my wife and I first went out there, we were putting coats on and raincoats to try to stay dry. Now, the last, last year when we went out there was 78 degrees in February, uh, January and February. And it's just uh, it's 20, 25 degrees warmer than it used to be. And I'm not a big global warming guy, so don't. I'm, I'm not into that, but because I, I think it's just a phenomenon. We're seeing warmer, it's drought out there, we're <coughs> cold out here, and so it's just one of them things. But uh, so, and I do have some, if anybody's interested, I have a very limited supply of my, my reading resource. It's called the American Bee Journal. I do have three. <laughs> so the first three people that <laughs> can come up and grab one, but I, 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 I don't save too many of them, but I, I rummaged through and found what I could. Yes? Who grows the bees that you buy as replacement? California. Yeah. So they, there's some there that all they do is grow bees? That's all they, well, that's part of their main income mm -hmm. is growing bees and raising queens. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. They generate two or three times as much money per hive as we do with with that extra income of the bees. And, and they're not into the honey part of it. They're into the honey part of it. But but it's kind of a, a sideline to them mm -hmm. because they make so much money off the packages and the queens in April and May. Do they guarantee? Well, <laughs> no, no. And unfortunately, we're seeing some queen issues right now. I was talking to Bonnie about it earlier. We've actually been, my daughter spent the whole day putting queens in today. Uh, we're having queens dying off for some reason. and. Uh, so we're buying queens and that little bug is very expensive and yeah. we're hoping to get a good acceptance rate. If we get a good acceptance rate, then it's well worth the, the expense. But in the past, sometimes this time of year, we don't get a good acceptance rate, but we've got to try something because the pollination out in California is so lucrative. Uh, that's what keeps us going. And so we have to, we have to try to get a queen right. Unfortunately, with all the sweet clover around, we our honey production from those hives just goes to nothing. Yes. Um, I was going to ask. You said you misunderestimated the mites. What can you do? Well, 
I can I can treat, and what I should have done this spring, I have a chemical that we use that the active ingredient is tactic. I should have treated about three different times this last spring instead of just once. We have, you know, we have a, especially it, it, most of the time out in the bee yard, it's just me. And 1,500 hives is a lot. Most operators run between 800 and 1,000 per man, per company. They run less than 1,000 hives per hired hand. Well, I'm trying to run almost twice that. And so I could have treated more. Uh, but there again, it, it, part of it is a, a chemical issue. We're, we're being told by the chemical companies, we're about, we've already lost one of our best pesticides as far as killing these uh, mites. We've lost it from the American, the, the manufacturer because of money. We used to be able to treat our bees with this chemical for about 15 to 20 cents a colony. Well, those people weren't making any money off that. So they shut it down. There's still a source in Mexico and there's people driving across Mexico probably right now as we speak because the domestic beekeeper uses so much of this, this stuff. It's called, it's a, it's called, it's Amitraz is the active ingredient in it. Now, do we want that in our honey? Obviously not. We're making food and I'm very, very cognizant of that. It is a pesticide. We're putting it in the beehive. But we only do it in the winter when they're out in California and here early in the spring. We don't have our honey boxes on there. But because it was so cheap, uh, they, they took it away from us. So we're funneling it in from Mexico right now. And the thing about it is they started, there's a, no, a new miticide that's coming out with this chemical in it, but it costs $5 a colony <laughs> instead of 20 cents. That's what this whole thing was about, get rid of this chemical, was to how can we, how, because it's, it's in demand and there's millions of hives in America and they're being treated two and three and four times a year. So you're talking some serious money and they just weren't making enough money on it. So they shut it down here and then, and then they bring it back in a, in a different package that costs too much money for most beekeepers. Yes, sir. Uh, tell people what uh, makes the best honey. What pollen? What pollen? Well, yeah. What, what the bee or floral source? Yeah. <coughs> well, I think I think sweet clover, bar none, to me is, is the best floral source. I mean, and, and next to that would certainly be alfalfa. And that's why when you when you see a commercial beekeeper in in any given area. His bee yards, his bee locations are almost always next to an irrigated alfalfa. Our second choice would be dry land alfalfa. But, uh, and I have some of my better locations, honestly, are out in northwest of Ranchester on some dry land. But there's, there's good alfalfa stands out there. And this year, because of the rain, that there might even be a second cutting on some of the dry land alfalfa. But uh, I think sweet clover and, and alfalfa are some of the Let's just see they're nicer looking honey. When you go to a store shelf, I always, I always lean towards the, the lighter colored honey. Now, for cooking and stuff, the, the, some people prefer the darker honey because it's got more of a bite to it. Uh, but, but sweet clover is, and Gene, Gene Davis called me the other day. He said, Cliff, where's it? He's, he's in charge of, some of you might know him, uh, some of the garden, uh, the garden. Community around garden. community garden area. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. He said, "Where's all the bees at?" And I said, "Well, Gene, I said they're stumbling over themselves out the front door on this sweet clover." I said, "There's so much sweet clover around the, the gardeners. You're just out of luck <laughs> until the sweet clover's gone and burned up. And it's for the most part right now. It's it's pretty much gone. It'll be gone in another week or so. But but yeah, the the bees are not going to go in to a town and forage on." tomato plants and uh, this little plant here and there when there's thousands of acres of sweet clover that's three foot tall out in the field. Yes, sir. It, it's more dangerous for them to go into town because <coughs> homeowners are notorious about treating oh, the yeah. whole lawn with something at a higher rate yeah. that it needs to be treated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yes. You need McKenzie to get you a natural pest control for the 
Well, and they're they they're working on it. Yeah. They're working on it. Yes. Pat. Do you uh, uh, do you sell your honey locally or? We do. We sell we sell it under Tongue River Honey. Uh, my daughter has taken over the the packaged honey part of it. Uh, she sells to the Good Health Emporium, and then there's another the health food store, a brand new one that started down by the Sheridan Press. Uh, Sackett's Market. Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody off the top of my head. And then the stores out in Dayton and Ranchester.